has anyone shared of TileDB before, before we start? Just to get a sense of, of the audience. Okay, so you don't need to. Well, hopefully after this talk, you're gonna know everything about TileDB. So TileDB is a system that we started at Interlabs and MIT uh, quite a while ago. And since then, we, we spun it out into its own startup. Uh, but, you know, uh, as, uh, to be respectful towards the PyData community, community, we're gonna talk only about the open source stuff today. And everything you're gonna hear in this presentation is open source under the MIT license. <laughs> All right, so let's start with the problem. Oh, something's going on with it's this one. one. Very good. Okay, so let's start with the problem. Um, we will be focusing exclusively on storage. So although there is a DB part in TileDB, uh, this presentation is gonna be about its storage aspect. Of course, we have a long, a very big vision about TileDB. Again, we are talking about persistent storage of massive data, right? And because of the fact that it's massive, we, uh, when we say persistent, we mean stored essentially on a disk or on, on an object store on the cloud, not in memory. Um, the biggest problem that we experienced while working on multiple verticals is that um, there is a plethora of different formats, right? Before you store the data, you need to decide on the format, how you're going to store the data. And if you have worked on, uh, on a vertical like genomics, for example, you're gonna see tons of different formats, different specifications, most of them quite complicated. Then you go to the LiDAR vertical, you see something completely different. Then you go to databases and you have proprietary formats or parquet or maybe some other um, formats. So there is in, indeed a lot of different formats out there for storage. Now, another thing that you need to bear in mind is that you, you don't really just specify the format, you create actually a library or some tool to parse this format, right? To, to essentially, you know, store the data into the storage pipeline and then retrieve the data into main memory in order to do computations. So any new library that is built around the format has to implement one of, actually all of those aspects, right? The backend support, for example, it's gonna work on S3 or Azure or on, on, on a distributed file system. You need to do some uh, efficient um, uh, software development as well, for example, you need to do to be able to do parallel I/O because we're talking about massive data. Uh, you can, you have to do parallel compression and so many other things. So all these different formats have to be associated with libraries that can do all that fancy stuff. And one of the facts uh, that again um, was extremely important for us, and we can debate about this uh, uh, offline later if you like, is that if you're doing some efficient downstream computations, you're probably using some sophisticated software like like a linear algebra package. And uh, these kind of packages work directly on vectors or arrays anyway, right? So regardless of the fact that you may have a very creative format that is very, very compressed on the desk, at the end of the day, you need to bring the data in, into main memory, lay it out into some sort of vectors of, or multidimensional arrays and do the computation on them using these packages. So to summarize, and this is perhaps the most, the most important thing to do now, is that we see two common problems. So across verticals, we see some redundant software engineering because all these tools are sharing some of the, of, of the aspects that, that need to be implemented. And the second thing is that there is a lot of expensive conversion from whatever format you have, whatever data you're storing into, uh, into arrays to do the downstream computations. So because of that, we are focusing on multidimensional arrays to begin with. So these, these are our first class citizens in our world. And a multidimensional array looks like this, essentially. It's, it's a multidimensional object which is composed of, of little squares called cells. And they can have different shapes and different dimensionality. This is the, the simple way to, to, uh, to describe this. Now, getting a little bit more into detail about what an array is, let's focus on a two-dimensional example. We can have dimensions, like here, for example. You can have as many dimensions as you like. The dimensions, have, the dimensions can have types, right? It can be integers or it can be even floats in some uh, certain applications. And these little squares are the elements of the array. They're called cells. And these are the, the, actual, the actual objects that are storing the values. And in here, you can store as many values as you like. For example, you can have as many fields as you like of any, of any type you, you want. For example, here in this example, which is going to be running through the presentation, we have an integer attribute and a string attribute. And all the cells are responsible for storing an integer and a string. So it's kind of structured. Now, also something extremely important to, to uh, emphasize on from the beginning of this presentation is this distinction we are making 
between dense arrays and sparse arrays. A dense array uh, uh, has all its, its cells storing a value, even if it is an empty value. For example, if this little cell, you don't have anything to store in it, you need to store some null value. You need to specify something to store in it. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a sparse array, you are allowed to have actually empty cells. And sparse arrays uh, usually occur when, um, when the majority of the cells are empty. And we're going to discuss more about this later. So we have dense and sparse arrays. And the, the goals for, you know, around storing and accessing this data uh, boil down to two things, essentially. Slicing, so you, uh, you usually uh, define a multidimensional hyper-rectangle, and you need all the data falling in that rectangle. And also compression, because again, our data is massive. <laughs> now, I'll um, give you a couple of applications that can be that, uh, for which we can model the data as multidimensional arrays. The first one is LiDAR. So this, is, this photo is taken from a very cool project uh, at NYU that you should definitely check out. So LiDAR data are essentially three-dimensional points in space in an enormous space that form surfaces, like this one, for example. This is the city of Dublin. And uh, these are essentially three-dimensional. There is a three-dimensional space. There is a lot of empty space because you don't store a LiDAR point for the air, for example. You, you store it only for uh, the surface of the objects. And obviously, th these are the non-empty cells in this, in this domain. So this is a huge three-dimensional sparse array. Now, in imaging, for medical imaging, for example, uh, where you have x-rays and MRIs, <laughs> you can represent, or you should represent the data as two-dimensional images, or sometimes they can be three-dimensional for, for MRIs, for example. And in that case, the, uh, the data is dense because these are images. You're actually storing pixel values in, in the cells. Then you may have genomics. This is another vertical where you have massive data. And it turns out, and we can discuss about this a little bit later if you're interested, uh, this turns out to be a two-dimensional data set, naturally sparse. So on one axis, you have people, you have the population. On the other axis, you have the genomic positions. And this is a massive array. <laughs> Another application is time series, which uh, you can think of as a, you know, the data set is a bunch of vectors, where every vector is a time series for a stock. Uh, and you can, of course, always collapse them into a matrix, if you like. And finally, even tabular data can be represented as one-dimensional array. So tabular data is kind of a degenerate case. It's a bunch of vectors, one vector per attribute. Now, before proceeding, I would like to make another distinction between the storage, a storage module and the, and the DBMS. And again, again, I would like us to avoid the confusion uh, of the TileDB name. Um, in this talk, we're talking about storage, so let's explain what this means. So, the storage module is responsible for stuff like I.O., compression, access and slicing, some APIs to higher level application or higher level modules, and other filters. So it's very low level, in other words. A DBMS, on the other hand, <laughs> has a query language, a parser, an optimizer, an executor, and several other fancy things. And the layout you see is something like this. The storage module has to appear in every DBMS. Like every DBMS has some storage module. <coughs> However, again, we would like to emphasize that the storage module can be also standalone. You don't need to store all your data in a DBMS and access the data through an ODBC connector, for example. You can use this storage module, at least this, this is the way we architect RDB. You can just use it as standalone, and you, know, you can use APIs on top to access the data directly without having to go through the database. So what is TileDB for, for the purposes of this presentation? TileDB is a storage module. So this is the open source part of it. And uh, TileDB defines a novel multidimensional array format. So it's, it's, a, it's a specification. It's a format with a library. And this is the architecture. Like, this is the way you should think about TileDB. These are the backends. You can have cloud object stores. You can have distributed file systems. You can have even your, your laptop's file system. TileDB is sitting on top. It's a very thin layer on top of storage. Uh, it's a C++ library because we're, um, we're focusing a lot on performance. But at the same time, we have a lot of APIs. And we're going to talk about the, the Python and R APIs a little bit more extensively later. And using these APIs, we even have integration to Spark and Presto so that we can do some more fancy things. And we're going to talk about this as well. Now, a few things about the TileDB history. I, I used to work for Intel Labs and MIT. This is where this uh, project was, uh, was conceived in the beginning. In 2016, we had the first research prototype, so we got a top-tier database paper in. 
Um, in 2017, uh, after some successes we had, we spun it out of, uh, of Interlabs and MIT and uh, we, we incorporated a new company. We have all these nice people that you should definitely connect uh, afterwards, they're all here. They are magicians, so make sure that you talk to them. And 2018 and onwards, we're hiring. So you know, come and talk to us if, if you like our project. Okay, so now I'm gonna get into the intrinsics of the TileDB format. There is a lot of documentation online. So here, because of time constraints, I'm gonna touch on, on the most important features so that you understand why we're different from other formats, for example. So this is a two-dimensional example again. So again, suppose we have two attributes. One is integer, one is string. And this is how we lay out the data. Regardless of how many dimensions you have, at the end of the day, you have single dimensional files, right? Regardless of how big your space is, you need to, to map the, the multi-dimensional cells into the one-dimensional space. So this is what IDB allows you to do through this uh, tiling approach that we have and the cell layout. Again, there is a lot of theory in it, but what you need to understand is that IDB allows you to map the multi-dimensional space to a one-dimensional space in a way that you retain the spatial properties of your data. And I'm gonna show you an example in a bit. Another uh, important uh, thing here is that we split the attributes into different files that can be separately compressed. So essentially, TileDB is a columnar format. Let me just put it this way, where a column here is an attribute. It's not, it's not a column on one axis here, right? So this is very important for, for performance. So here you can see the integer attribute at the top and then the string attribute has two files because it's variable length, and this is how we handle variable length attributes. We're storing the offsets in a separate file that, are, that is very highly compressible to the beginning of each file. And this allows us to, to search on strings very, very uh, fast. Now, back to the spatial locality, suppose that we have this slice, uh, this, um, this slicing query, a subarray essentially, you can see that with this layout that we chose, if you try to identify where in the files where we will find these requested cells, you can see that we have a good chance of finding them continuously in the file. And this is extremely important for performance because we can do this kind of I.O. extremely fast. So the key here is to lay out the data so that parallel I.O., for example, or any kind of I.O. we do is extremely fast because it is finding the results close to each other in the files. The, um, the sparse case is very, very similar. The only difference is that in the sparse case, uh, because we don't know exactly where the non-empty cells are, we don't store anything for empty values. This is important. We're saving a lot of space. But we, are, we have to store the actual indices, the actual coordinates of the non-empty cells. So this is truly the only difference, plus some very lightweight indexing in main memory that we do for this kind of arrays. And you get a unified view, a unified API, and so on and so forth for both dense and sparse arrays. Uh, on disk, this is how this looks like. Every array is a folder. It is truly a folder. It's not a, a huge blob. Uh, you have some metadata files. And then for every write that we do, we have a, sub, a timestamp subfolder. I'm going to get to that in the next slide. So imagine that the, that the data falls into this timestamp subfolder. For the sparse case, it's exactly the same, but there is a coordinates file and some more indexing metadata over here in the fragment metadata file. And that's it. Uh, this particular format allows us to do very fast updates and uh, with some other perks, for example, fault tolerance. So let me explain how this works. Our updates are batched, so you'd better accumulate a lot of updates and then flash rather than doing cell by cell, this is not going to be very wise. You can do it, but it's going to be relatively slower. So suppose that initially you load this into, into the array. This creates a timestamp subdirectory, as you can see on the right. Then suppose that you want to update only this corner, so only this tile, for example. This becomes a different subfolder, so all files in our world are immutable. We never do updates in, in, uh, in place. And finally, in the dense array, you can even do sparse updates. This is treated as a separate snapshot of a sparse array, and this becomes a third subfolder. So this is the main idea. Of course, the user just sees the actual, the, the, the final snapshot. It's like superimposing every update called the fragment 
on top of, the, of, of each other to get this logical view. And our real algorithm is very, very efficient very, and very, very sophisticated to touch as little redundant information as possible across all those folders. And in addition to that, because this looks a lot like the log stru structured merge trees approach, uh, we have a very nice consolidation algorithm. If, for example, your num the number of your folders is getting out of hand, we can purge very, very efficiently into one directory that essentially has this view. Okay, a few more uh, nice features uh, in TileDB. We are all about performance. So we have uh, a very nice feature about filters that is coming up in uh, version 1.4, and this is going to happen in a couple of days. So remember, the data along one attribute is a file, right, in one fragment. So suppose that this is a binary file. Now, the concept of tile is useful because this is the atomic unit of I.O., and it is essentially a collection of values contiguous in the file, so this is the tile. And what we do is that we chunk the tile even further in pieces that can fit in L1 cache. This is extremely important for performance. And then we run each chunk into a filter pipeline that the user might, might have defined, and we do everything in parallel. So this is extremely efficient in, in TileDB. Uh, we have a collection of filters. Of course, we do a lot of different compression algorithms. We have byte and bit shuffle, encryption, delta encoding, bit width re uh, reduction, and this, this is a growing list. Now, another extremely important thing about TileDB <laughs> is that it works beautiful, beautifully currently on S3, and soon uh, on Azure, Google Cloud, and Alibaba Cloud, because and this is because of the format. Like, this is an artifact of, of the format. For example, if you have a code that works pretty, pretty well on your laptop, and then you just change the name of the array from my array to an S3 URI, everything is just going to work as efficiently. Right? This, this is a big thing. You don't need to change to another library. You don't need to set up a service. Your, the code just works. The second thing is that although there is no concept of directories on S3, the, the slash character in the, in, the, in the path has a very natural intuitive meaning, right? It's a hierarchical path. So this works beautifully for us. And it works beautifully because we can run this command from the, from the command line interface of S3 and say, okay, we're gonna sync a local uh, directory to the cloud in a bucket. So for example, an array directory to, to the cloud. Then if you start querying the cloud, it's, everything is just gonna work and vice versa. If you have created an array on S3 and you sync it down to, to a folder locally, your code is just going to work by changing the URI. And as I mentioned, of course, we're adding more backends. Now, in terms of parallelism, once again, I mentioned that uh, TileDB is big in performance. So it's fully multi-threaded, right, using uh, Intel TBB. Uh, TileDB does not rely on an external library for parallelism. It does, it, it does everything in the code. Um, we, of course, have, uh, we're very serious about thread and process safety. There is no need for locking because of the way we create immutable objects. There is no way to have faults. We, we are fault tolerant in that respect. There is no um, issue of corruption. And we have a multiple reader, multiple writer model. This is very different from, from other formats. We, of course, we're very big in, in parallel I.O. as well. We do a lot of optimizations for S3. For example, we're using the S3 multipart upload a lot. We use byte range requests in parallel. So we do a lot of fancy things there. We do parallel filters, parallel sorting, parallel slicing. So everything in TileDB is parallel. In terms of APIs, as I mentioned, TileDB is a C++ library. It exposes the C API. We're building a C++ API on top of, of the C API. And we have a Python, R, Go, and Java API uh, as well. So we are extremely big in, um, in, uh, in terms of integration. Uh, we, uh, we already started work on both Spark and Presto. Essentially, you can have Spark data frames and you can do SQL queries using Presto through that on TileDB data because we created the appropriate connectors. The Presto connector is going to be open sourced very, very soon. And um, we are extremely, again, careful about creating these API interfaces in a very lightweight manner. For example, uh, when you're slicing a TileDB array into a NumPy array, we do some very careful work there. For example, we allocate the NumPy uh, array in the Python world. Then we take the C pointer of the NumPy array, and this is what we're pushing into TileDB. And TileDB performs a zero copy in your NumPy array. So 
it's not a trivial integration. We, we, we get very deep into the details of, of these APIs. We have predicate pushdown. We do a lot of stuff um, around Spark and Presto. And we do a lot of partitioning because this, uh, uh, this software is, uh, is uh, parallel in a multi-processing way. So we, we help the software um, uh, achieve performance on time with data. So I'm going to essentially finish with a little comparison for those that are familiar with other formats. For example, HDFI is very popular. Uh, Zar also in the Python world and Parquet. So let me, um, let me mention a couple of things. So first of all, um, TalDB, HDFI, and Zar are formats for multidimensional arrays, but not Parquet. In Parquet, there is no notion of, of multidimensional arrays. Uh, TalDB is the only format that can uh, perform natively um, on, uh, uh, they can, it can support natively sparse arrays. Uh, pretty much all the, all the formats are doing compression and filter, so everybody's good there. In terms of parallelism, TileDB pushes all the parallelism down to TileDB. It don't depend on another layer on top that, that the other uh, systems do. Uh, for example, Zark uh, uses parallel compression through BLOS, but then it relies on Dask for, for the rest of the stuff. And the same goes for parallel I.O. We do everything in, in our code. Uh, we have multiple writers, multiple readers versus single writer, multiple readers on, on HDF5. And the rest are pushing, pushing this up to the applications. In terms of updates, because of this, of this design, we're extremely fast on the cloud. Whereas um, for, for the rest of the formats, you need to change a bigger chunk of data. In our case, you just change what you actually change. This is the only thing that you write. The other formats have to take a bigger piece, like a chunk or a file, and copy it. Um, for S3 support, note that everything is open source in our world. Uh, HCF5, to the best of our knowledge, this is in the Enterprise Edition. Uh, Zara, of course, is open source. And for, for Parquet, it, it is just pushed to, to, to a higher level. Uh, and finally, in terms of APIs, we want to uh, integrate with the, the, with the wider ecosystem. Of course, Python is uh, one of our most popular APIs, but, uh, you know, uh, R is a, sec a, a close second, for example, and also we have Java. Uh, whereas uh, the rest are pretty good in that respect. Zara is a beautiful project, but it works only in, in Python. Um, by the way, uh, just to let you know, this, uh, the choice of these parameters was not intentional. It just happened to, uh, for us to be very, very good. At, uh, at this. <laughs> just to let you know, OK? All right, uh, very small comment uh, around Arrow. I'm pretty sure there are people here that uh, are fans of Arrow. We, we are fans of Arrow as well. This is an in-memory calling our form, right? This is the in-memory analog of, of Parquet, essentially, uh, which is pretty good. Um, per persistence for Arrow is delegated either to Parquet, for example, or um, you, you can achieve it through MEMA. TileDB is, of course, more, more flexible around that. And there is an integration with Parquet coming up. So please stay tuned if, if you're interested. Um, with this, I'm going to close the presentation. This is the first time we participate in the PyData. Uh, community. <laughs> we, we have been very meticulous uh, uh, in order to, to uh, come up with a, with a great project to share with you, and now we're in a good stage to do so. So if you're interested in both sparse and dense arrays, and you want to get persistence, and you, get, you, you want integration with the wider ecosystem, and you are very big in performance, and you're very big in um, integrating, integrating with multiple backends, Perhaps you, you should just take a look uh, at Alibi. So with that, thank you very much on my part. If I have not made it clear enough, we are hiring. And I would like to, to let uh, Jake for, for at least a few minutes show you a couple of cool stuff we can do with Alibi. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so I'm going to show off some uh, work that we have done with, uh, with our team members, uh, Tyler and uh, Seth. So the first project that we did in the spring was with the Naval Postgraduate School. And it was just exploring, like, we had this sparse array data storage manager. What does that look like for LiDAR data? And LiDAR data is actually stored as a record format. So it's not in a columnar format. So this is just a kind of proof of concept work that we did with them. And so basically, we took uh, data from this project, which is uh, basically a, a high-def laser scan of Dublin City. And as you can see, this is just to get you a taste of what TileDB looks like. Um, through Python, you know, in, import pandas, tilelb, numpy. Um, we basically load the, the pre-ingested tilelb array. This is from local, so on our file system. And you can see our domain here is pretty simple, right? X, Y, and Z coordinates in some projected common coordinate space. You need the font bigger? Uh, the font bigger? Sure. 
and you can clearly get that work. Is that better? Cool. And so, uh, what people don't know about is that the ladder format is actually very rich. So you have X, Y, and Z, but also if you're doing GIS stuff, right, you have all these other attributes that are collected for every single LiDAR point. And so most of these are not used in your analysis, right? So you want to do some type of projection from the database community or basically just say, I want to focus on X, Y, and Z, and I want to ignore intensity, returns, flags, all this other stuff, right? It, in, in, in my analysis. And the problem with the, the LiDAR format, since it's record-based, you have to basically skip over those parts of the file you know, in memory, so you lose your memory locality in that space. So we basically reorganized it into attributes. So for every X, Y, and Z point, we have uh, an attribute with different data types using different compressors, because some compressors work better for some types of data than others. And so here we're just grabbing the data, and you can see that the coordinates are just you know, stored as a, a record, in TileDB they're stored as a record, because, uh, and they're just in a NumPy array format directly. And uh, we can basically extract out the X, Y, and Z, and we're here just gonna show you like basically a small subset of the data. And as you can see, here's some just raw LiDAR points. It's kind of hard to see, which is the raw points, but you can kind of make out buildings and streets and stuff. And as we go down here, uh, oops, we gotta read. Each, each point is further classified um, basically by uh, whether it's uh, vegetation or whether it's ground. So we can extract out those points and then basically uh, color the result object based on the LiDAR classification. And as you can see here, like we do some decimation. You can see the building's a lot more better. That's just to highlight the buildings. But you can see like a park over here because that's a lot of vegetation. So it's just showing you that you know, we didn't do anything special with TileDB. This is taking a generic LiDAR format, re-ingesting it into TileDB, and you can do all sorts of the analysis that you're used to on LiDAR data. So this is another just basically simple demo, which is showing you S3 integration. So this is pre-ingested data that's uh, financial data on S3. And so we're here just basically, this is basically the fragment layout that uh, Stavros described before. And we're gonna load the data. And we're gonna see here that this is our dimensions that, we're, um, that we set up. And this is, when you think about it, like a, a multi-dimensional index on top of a traditional database table, right? Ordered in time. And so here are the attributes. So you have a bunch of different attributes. And a common analysis that you want to do, again, is, is a projection, right? You wanna only focus on subsets of attributes on some range query, some query in time. So, um, one thing that Seth are, has been working on a lot and from our team is working on Presto integration. So what's cool is that, you know, we can take our common format and we can um, just natively hook it up to a, a decoupled database like Presto, and now you can perform SQL queries on your, your array data sets that way up, up here we just read it directly into NumPy, Python. But you can do the same type of operations, exactly the same type of operations in SQL. And so here's a you know like a traditional array query where we're we're subsetting on bid size, bid price, size, offer price, offer size, um, over all dates for these times, and uh, for these sequence IDs. So a traditional like NumPy array slicing syntax, right? So this is a traditional array query that you want to do. And it takes a little bit of time because this is about you know I don't forget how many gigabytes of data. But you can perform the exact same analog in SQL, right? Uh, and do a native query with Presto. And so um, this is basically showing like we do our projections or so selecting on some sets of attributes or dimensions uh, from this pre-ingested data set. And this is our basically our range query. And we're just limiting the print. There's no push down for uh, Presto for, for limits. But we're just limiting it so it only prints out a little bit of results. So it just shows that you can, you know, natively, there's no reason to have all your data locked up into a database system. If you do batch updates, that type of storage of data, you can upload to S3 and work on it with whatever tooling you're, you're comfortable with or whatever tooling solves your problem, right? You can do SQL for maybe ETL or just, you know, maybe some people in your team are more familiar with it. Or you can do direct analysis, load into a NumPy arrays, work on it in pandas. 
uh, do some fancier type of analysis that that would be very difficult to do in SQL, all in the same format, all in the same system, pretty seamlessly. So that's the goal that we're trying to, to push for in the future. Um, so that's my spiel. And I think we're ready for questions. Yep. Anyone have any questions? Um, can you describe your type system? Yeah. So our type system is is pretty simple right now. On um, it's mostly just your common scalar formats that are available in NumPy, and we also have variable arbitrary variable length um, data types. So data types that you would need to store almost you know all SQL um, values except date time. So date time is a big one that we're working on now. Um, and we have string support. But uh, hierarchical objects that arrows would support, like sets or uh, nested JSON arrays, or, you know, like that type of data type, we, we don't support yet. But we can serialize into an arbitrary Bob. So uh, the format is agnostic. To, it's just, you know, it, it stores bytes. It can be fixed sized or variable sized. And everything works on that abstraction. So uh, plugging in a, a more efficient type system is a to do. And or, you know, like more expressive types, um, and we can build on top of that. There's nothing. There's there's it's, the system's already we, we're rewriting it so that that that's just an extension in the future that we can continue add on. But yeah, some of these types are very important, um, especially if you want to share between systems. Right, you have to have a common type tag representation to make sure that you do the conversion correctly. Anyone else? Any any other questions? From the Python API point of view, if you slice or select some part of an array and it's stored as sparse on the far end, do you get a sparse object out or, or do you just get a NumPy array? So that's a good question. Uh, since, our, since we want to work with multidimensional sparse arrays, right, because we want to support arbitrary dimensions, uh, Python only ha doesn't have very good support for that. There's there's currently projects in the community to support um, n-dimensional sparse objects, so we, we basically store our the, the, the memory representation you think of as is a coordinate format, right? We're a coordinate format for sparse arrays, so uh, yes, it's very easy to take our coordinate format and then convert it into a, a SciPy sparse array, but we don't do that for you because uh, it doesn't right. It only would work for two dimensions, um, so. It doesn't. It doesn't generalize very well, uh, but it's very easy to do. Anyone else have any other questions? Hi, great talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, how expensive would it be to re-implement TileDB in something like JavaScript? I asked this question because with HDF we had this problem where there was really just one implementation, and all of our data was tied to one group's code. Yeah. So what's how hard would it be to replace you? So the format itself would be very easy to replace because the format is is designed to be simple. Because we want, like, if you have an open spec format, you want it to be simple, right? Um, so that would be pushed to the read algorithm, and you could re-implement all that in JavaScript. I think the only blocker that we would have is if you wanted compression. There's very limited compression options available. To to my knowledge, I'm not a JavaScript programmer. Um, uh, available for JavaScript natively. So I don't know what the support in JavaScript is to say like cross compile CSTD into WebAssembly and then run that, or how big it would be, or if it would even make sense. So I'm very confident that we could create a project to natively read TileDB arrays in JavaScript without compression, without the full suite of compressors that we support, basically. Um, so uh, we haven't tried that uh, yet. But it would be an interesting project to see if we could like rip out. Well, all our compressors are modular, so if we ripped all that out and just had you know simple serialization, um, whether we probably could cross compile. I would imagine at this point because you know if you turn off threading too, that's also optional. Um, so yeah, I, I'm I'm pretty sure as long as you can cross compile C++ code now to JavaScript, it seems like it's getting pretty sophisticated. We we could do it. Um, just compression is an issue. So that would be something that we would have to talk about more like with a JavaScript expert, I think. 
Does anyone else have any questions? We have five minutes. Any other questions? Um, can you talk a little more about the parallelism, especially on the on the reading? So if I'm reading sure. a large array. So there's exactly. two. So so, so 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 we'll just use S3 as our example because that leverages the most amount of parallelism, right? So with S3, you get scalable. I mean, it's, it works amazingly well. You get really scalable I.O. with the number of thread issue requests, right? Up to some size from node size based on the bandwidth of the EC2 node to the S3 object store. So you want to spin up on large nodes a large number of threads. So we have a background. We basically abstracted part of our I.O. Um, component, and that's called our virtual uh, file system or you know, VFS layer. And that has its own internal th thread pool. So now that dispatches, you know, say, 20 threads, and they are doing multi-part get requests from an S3 object, right? That brings them into buffers into TileDB. Now, depending on if it's a dense array or a sparse array, so a sparse array you would have to maybe have to resort. Or well, first you have to run the filter pipeline backwards, right? So you would have to you know, decrypt, uncompress, and all that's done um, per chunk. So the work is divided up into small bits and run, you know, basically in in cache across all processes on your thread using the load balancing available through Intel TBB runtime. So we get massive parallelism on, on that side too. So basically, it scales since you know compression is a big 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 cost. Uh, it scales to the number of uh, cores that you have. It, it very efficiently uses. Uh, the number of core, or the number of threads, and the number of cores available, and then that's copied back into your buffer after it's decompressed. So parallel sorting is for for sparse, right? So you have a bunch of updates that might intersect with each other. So you have to compute the intersection of coordinates, and then basically deduplicate the coordinates, and then take the coordinates that were last written. And so all that algorithm has been rewritten, and so it's fully parallelized. Um, and then that was a lot of work. So uh, kudos to Tyler for pulling that off, but. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's uh, we basically rely on, on Intel a lot, uh, the Intel's TBB runtime a lot because it does a very very good job of load balancing, um, you know, to separate tasks and, and basically work stealing. Um, so, yeah, any other questions? Oh, we have two minutes for any questions. Anyone else have any questions? No. All right. Well, please give a round of applause for Jake. Thanks, guys.